there, I'm Lloyd Evans, and in this video we absolutely must talk about the Jehovah's Witness teaching regarding the Paradise Earth. So Jehovah's Witnesses believe that at some future point our planet will be landscaped into a global paradise where only righteous people are going to live. Well, they say righteous people. What they really mean is this is going to be a utopia in which the only authorized religion will be that of Jehovah's Witnesses. And to create this utopia, there needs to be an Armageddon in which billions of non-Jehovah's Witnesses unfortunately need to be killed. So that's roughly the teaching. And in this video, my patrons have asked me to go through the various logical problems with the Paradise teaching, presumably just in that brief description I've given you. You already have a few problems in your mind, but let's go through this systematically. Problem number one, the post-Armageddon cleanup operation. What would it possibly look like for the bodies of nearly 8 billion people to have to be removed? And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, probably you've not given this much thought, or you might derive some form of solace in what's been said in the publications where it's described birds achieving this goal. So birds are going to feast on the remains of those slain by Jehovah, or perhaps there's going to be some kind of magical divine radiation that's just going to vaporize all remains of the wicked. Interestingly, Garrett Loesch, in a recorded talk, once posited the idea that actually, no, it would require teams of brothers to go out post-Armageddon and bury the remains of those slaughtered. Billions of people will die, and they have to be buried. The Bible indicates in the prophecy that there will be groups of people, of brothers and sisters, that will for a long time, do nothing else than just bury the dead. Now, who knows whether this is still the way Garrett Loesch feels about Armageddon. One thing we can be certain of when it comes to the governing body or any individual members of the governing body is that they can change their minds just like that about almost any of their teachings. So it's quite possible that Garrett Loesch no longer believes that Jehovah's Witnesses will have to form burial teams. But just imagine if they did have to. Just imagine if it wasn't enough for the birds to feast on these carcasses. 7.6 billion men, women and children. Quite a grisly task to have to do at the beginning of the paradise. Essentially assist in concealing evidence of the biggest act of genocide ever to have been committed that we know of in the history of the universe. Point number two on my list of problems with the Paradise teaching, the animals. They're apparently all suddenly going to become herbivores. Obviously some animals already are herbivores, but carnivores specifically, lions, crocodiles, poisonous snakes, sharks, pretty much any animal that lives off eating other animals is just going to quit, is just going to munch on vegetation. Presumably sharks are going to munch on seaweed, lions are just going to eat grass, crocodiles, same. This is what you believe as a Jehovah's Witness. It's one of those teachings that you try not to think about because it's so obviously preposterous to anyone who has spent any time at all looking at the animal kingdom and how it works 
and how there's an obvious ecosystem involving a food chain as one of its core components, suddenly all of that just goes up in the air. Everything just has to be reinvented, including the nature of the animals. They all suddenly will apparently quit eating each other. Hopefully I don't need to explain <laughs> why this is a preposterous idea, but that nonetheless is what you have to believe if you follow the concept of the Jehovah's Witness paradise. Point number three, the resurrection. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that after Armageddon, once the earth has begun being sculpted into this paradise utopia, people will gradually start being resurrected. Who are these people who are being resurrected? They're not the people who've been killed at Armageddon. They're not the 7.6 billion men, women and children who've been slaughtered for the crime of not being Jehovah's Witnesses. God hasn't killed them only to immediately bring them back <laughs> into paradise. That's not how it works. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that over the thousand-year period, the thousand-year reign of Jesus following Armageddon, every man, woman, and child who has ever lived throughout human history, right up to just before Armageddon, will gradually be resurrected into the paradise and be given the opportunity to be a Jehovah's Witness. That's the teaching. It was actually re-emphasized during the 2020 Always Rejoice convention. And as I commented at the time in my rebuttal, it makes no sense whatsoever. I did some brief research when I was first gathering my thoughts, doing that rebuttal, trying to think of a way to explain it. And one of the things I first tried doing was Googling, what's the maximum possible capacity of our planet in terms of population? How many human beings can this planet sustain? And naively, I assumed it would be more <laughs> than our living on the planet now. And you can get any number of different figures, but there are quite a number of scientists who say we're already there. The planet is already overpopulated in terms of the current population of 7.6 billion. That's too much for the population to sustain itself without damaging the planet. That's the whole problem with climate change, with pollution, with the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, with the impact on biodiversity. There's simply too many of us already. Already our planet is overpopulated with 7.6 billion. But Jehovah's Witnesses are saying, let's just crank that up, shall we? <laughs> I think the figure I, when I last checked, if you type in to Google how many people have ever lived, the answer that's going to flash up is 107 billion people. That's citing an article on bbc.com. There are currently 7 billion people alive today. And the Population Reference Bureau estimates that about 107 billion people have ever lived. Jehovah's Witnesses are saying, <laughs> let's all live on the planet together. There's room for everyone. <laughs> and the way it was explained when I was a Jehovah's Witness was that you could actually take that kind of number of people and there would still be room for approximately an acre of land per person. But I'm going to come to a problem with that later on in this list. Problem number four with the paradise teaching is how do you achieve a high standard of living with zero industry or infrastructure? There was actually a music video recently put out on JW Broadcasting 
showing Jehovah's Witnesses living in paradise, living in this fabulous wooden villa <laughs> with machined lumber and lots of machined metal parts, including, as I recall, some kind of chrome effect chimney. <laughs> And they're all enjoying this fabulous luxury property. And someone comes out of nowhere who is a resurrected family member and they're reunited. And so the point of the music video is to, again, emphasize this teaching, not just of the paradise, but of resurrected ones being reunited. Anyway, as I commented at the time, where's all this machined lumber coming from? <laughs> Where are all these bolts and metal cabling and rivets and all of those things which are so clearly the products of industry and of infrastructure? Who's manning the lumber mill <laughs> in this paradise? Who has to take time out from frolicking with pandas and mucking about eating fruit to go and do a shift in the lumber mill or in the metal foundry, or in the factory that's making all of these crucial components that would be needed in order to construct a luxury home of the type that's depicted in this music video. They really don't think this through. I said at the time, the more detail you go into in trying to show what this paradise looks like, the more problems you have the more questions you're inevitably raising in the minds of witnesses who are capable of thinking this through. In reality, if you took our planet and stripped it of all industry and all technology and all infrastructure, which is what Armageddon would effectively do, no electricity, no production lines, nothing of the sort, just fields and forests, and lakes and rivers and beaches what do you have you're back to as i as i've argued before you're back to the time of braveheart you're, you're back to the 12th century the dark ages when people lived in mud people just scavenged whatever they could they lived in mud or stone or wood huts they didn't have toilets they didn't have plumbed water they didn't have electricity it was rubbish <laughs> that's how people would be living if you just annihilated or removed all of the advancement that has been achieved by satan's system of things point number five we get to the issue of the resurrected dead not being able to marry i actually devote a section of my book the reluctant apostate to this issue it's found on pages 120 and 121 under the heading status of resurrected spouses it's something that's affected me personally or at least it affected my family because my mother died when i was 21 and one of the issues that most visibly affected my father was the fact that he didn't know what his relationship would be with my mother in the paradise once she was resurrected and you might be thinking if you've never had anything to do with jehovah's witnesses well what would the problem be they're resurrected they can just pick up where they left off the problem is there's a scripture in luke 20 verse 34 which raises significant problems for this concept of married couples reuniting so in luke chapter 20 jesus gets asked the question teacher moses wrote us if a man's brother dies leaving a wife but he was childless his brother should take the wife and raise up offspring for his brother now there were seven brothers the first took a wife but died childless, so the second and the third married her. Likewise, even all seven, they died and left no children. Finally, the woman also died. Consequently, in the resurrection, whose wife will she become? For the seven had her as a wife. 
So Jesus is being asked by religious leaders, Sadducees at the time, about this complicated issue involving marriage. And Jesus answers in verse 34, Jesus said to them, the children of this system of things marry and are given in marriage, but those who have been counted worthy of gaining that system of things and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, this verse makes total sense if, like as most Christians, you believe that when you die, you go to heaven. Because what Jesus goes on to say is, in fact, neither can they die anymore, for they are like the angels, and they are God's children by being children of the resurrection. So Jesus says that when you're resurrected, you're like an angel, you can't marry or be given in marriage, hence my dad's problem of what will be my relationship with my wife once she's resurrected in the new system. There was a really interesting article that was released in 1987 in a Watchtower article where the writers basically said, it is what it is, get over it. In the new system, those who are resurrected who were once married won't be married anymore. Human emotions today might make this a difficult conclusion to accept, but it is to be noted that nowhere does the Bible say that God's resurrecting the faithful means restoring their marital status. Just get over it. Everything will work out one way or the other, was the message, at least in 1987. Now, as of 2014, the teaching has softened a little bit. A 2014 watchtower applied much more ambiguity. Is there sound reason for hoping that resurrected ones will be able to marry? Put simply, the answer is that we cannot say. So just shrugging their shoulders, kicking the problem into the long grass and saying we don't know what the situation is going to be for those who are resurrected who happen to have left behind widows or widowers. Again, the whole problem ceases to be a problem if you accept the mainstream Christian view that Christians who die go to heaven and become like angels. In that context, the verse in Luke isn't problematic at all. It's only a problem because Jehovah's Witnesses put this teaching or overlay this teaching of a paradise earth onto the Bible when it wasn't there previously. But I'll get to that later in the list. Problem number six with the Jehovah's Witness paradise I've chosen broken relationships because, let's face it, if the Jehovah's Witness theology is to be taken seriously, it will involve many surviving through Armageddon or being resurrected post-Armageddon into the paradise without their family being there because their family were perhaps destroyed at Armageddon or were in some other way found to be sinful or got disfellowshipped, or displeased God in some way, and therefore they don't get to be in the paradise for some arbitrary reason. Let's say it is just failing to accept the authority of the governing body. That's the basis on which someone's been slaughtered at Armageddon. And let's say this person has a mother or father who survives Armageddon, They've made it through, they're in the paradise, but their son or daughter has just been slaughtered for being an apostate, for not accepting the authority of the governing body. They've got to be blissfully happy even though they don't have their son or daughter with them, even though, especially if they're participating in the burial of bodies, they are complicit in this act of genocide that has also killed their son or daughter. What would that do to you psychologically? Jehovah's Witnesses would probably argue, well, in the paradise, 
everything's just going to be swell. We're promised that God will answer the desire of every living thing. Everything's magically going to be okay. So I don't know, maybe the mother or father whose disfellowshipped child isn't in paradise. Maybe God will change them so that they no longer miss their child. So that their child no longer matters to them. And to that I say, well, that's not the same person then, is it? If God has to change someone to make them happy, if God has to erase the memory of someone's child so that they no longer remember them or miss them, what God is doing is changing the person. So the person who is blissfully happy isn't the same person who made it through Armageddon because we are who we love. We are who we care about. We are defined by the relationships that we forge with our family members and with our friends. And if you're just going to snap your fingers and change someone so that they no longer care about someone that they actually care about a lot, then what you're doing is changing that person in their core. So that, for me, is an aspect of the Jehovah's Witness Paradise teaching that really doesn't make sense. Point number seven on my list is the notion of the deserts blossoming as the rose. This is based on a verse in Isaiah. And let me give you some context from a past publication, A 1994 Awake, to show how Jehovah's Witnesses use this scripture in Isaiah to indicate that the planet itself will be changed in terms of its climate, in terms of its very geology. So this 1994 Awake, September 22nd on page 12, reads as follows. The meek will inherit the earth. They will care for the air, the water and the soil. Springs and streams of water will soak the parched lands. Forests will clothe the mountains that have been denuded for selfish gain. Woodlands will flourish and former deserts will blossom as the rose. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk and the speechless will talk. And it quotes Isaiah 35 verses 1 to 7 where it says the wilderness and the parched land will exult and the desert plain will be joyful and blossom as the saffron. Now I'm going to come to this later, but what Jehovah's Witnesses do in justifying their Paradise Earth teaching is they take what are known as restorationist texts from the Old Testament. This is a classic example where it's using poetic language to say, when God's people are restored to their land post-exile in Babylon, everything's going to be fantastic. Everything's going to be okay if the Israelites worship God the way God wants them to worship him. Everything's just going to be prosperous. There won't be any hunger. People are going to live indefinitely in peace and prosperity and there won't even be any deserts. The desert plain will be joyful and blossom as the saffron. That was the purpose or the intent behind verses like Isaiah 35 verses 1 to 7. Jehovah's Witnesses come along and say, no, 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 it's not figurative. <laughs> Some verses in the Bible are figurative, but not this one because this one suits our narrative this is literal. This is saying that there will no longer be any deserts in the paradise. Everything's just going to be this verdant, tropical, Jamaica stroke Switzerland <laughs> utopia in which there's just green everywhere. Even on the mountains, it's man's fault that there aren't trees on the highest mountains. <laughs> Man's been chopping down trees on the top of Everest. That's why it's bare of trees. Yeah, the whole earth apparently is just going to be terraformed 
so that there won't be any more rocky, stony mountains. There won't be any more dry, sandy deserts. There won't be any more frozen tundras. As I mentioned earlier, when I cited the 100 billion figure, God needs that space. <laughs> he needs all of the land mass of planet Earth in order for there to be enough room for the 100 billion that he's bringing back so that there's somewhere for them to all live. And that's why, apparently, God needs to get rid of the deserts. But that's wrong. It, the Earth is a complicated ecosystem where even the deserts play a role. I watched something recently about how the wind carries sand from the desert, from the Sahara, and deposits it in the ocean, where it plays a part in the preponderance of microorganisms. Everything is interlinked on our planet. Everything plays a part. And quite frankly, even if there was no utility in something like a desert, you'd surely still want it to be there because it's beautiful. There is beauty in a desert. I haven't really visited any yet. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to go to the Sahara or go to parts of the Middle East, Jordan, and see some of these majestic vistas of just sand and rocks. But I want to be able to do that one day because they're beautiful. You see them on the television and sometimes in the movies, and you think, I want to experience that. That looks like an amazing place. And yet, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, oh no, everywhere is going to be like Switzerland and the Bahamas. That's what the planet's going to be like. God's going to completely terraform the planet so that this delicately balanced ecosystem is just uniformly like some featureless golf course <laughs> dotted with these log cabins. That's the paradise. That's how the earth was always intended to be. Point number eight is a relatively new teaching. And I say relatively new. I hadn't heard of this until literally the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention when Stephen Lett gave a grotesque homophobic rant claiming that gay people deserve to lose their lives if they were resurrected into the paradise being gay, but they would be given a hundred years to quit being gay. There'll be many others who will come back who will have to abandon their former way of life. I was thinking, as an example, a homosexual. But now, what if someone refuses to make the necessary changes? Well, the Watchtower commented on that. It said, after being given ample time, maybe even a hundred years, to seek God, some will show that they refuse to practice righteousness. Justly, they will lose life in the new world. As we can see from Isaiah 65, verse 12, which says, and the sinner will be cursed, even though he is a hundred years of age. As I said at the time, and I've said many times since then, apologies if I'm repeating myself, because we obviously dealt with this in my recent interview with Stephen Lett's niece, Brandy. I also cited this video in my 10 worst videos for 2020, so I won't dwell on this too much. But what Stephen Lett's suggesting makes no sense whatsoever. The teaching was always that those who are resurrected will be resurrected into perfect bodies. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that being gay is an abomination. Why would God resurrect people into imperfection, into being gay, and then order them to get rid of, to quit being gay, within this 100 year period? Are there supposed to be like gay communities in paradise 
where people can just live authentically, at least knowing, well, once a hundred years comes, your time is up and the Grim Reaper's going to come or whoever's going to come and execute you for being gay because you've had your 100 years. It's farcical. It's ridiculous. It's clearly just a man-made idea that Stephen Lett or perhaps one of his predecessors has come up with. It makes no sense for God to, well, first of all, kill people for the way he's created them. And number two, resurrect people as something that he objects to, which is being gay or lesbian or LGBTQ+. It makes no sense. But this is part of the Jehovah's Witness paradise teaching. We can expect it to contain the paradise LGBTQ plus individuals who are waiting for the Grim Reaper after a hundred years. Point number nine on my list, Paradise Cities. <laughs> it seems Guns N' Roses have had some influence on governing body teachings fairly recently <laughs> because as of, again, the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention, Jehovah's Witnesses were introduced for the first time that I'm aware of to the concepts of there being cities in the paradise. I mean, I guess it makes sense from a logistical point of view if we're talking about bringing back a hundred billion people. I can't see them all living in log cabins <laughs> spaced an acre apart, but that's not the point. The point is, how is it a paradise if you can have cities, the whole selling point of a paradise earth, when you look at the literature going back decades, is that never once did you see a city. Never once did you see a block of apartments or skyscrapers or anything like that. This would be a new world where everyone would be more closely connected with nature and everyone would be surrounded by God's creation. And then <laughs> David Splane just comes along and says, of course, uh, in the paradise, some of God's people might need to be assigned to cities. Yes, there are going to be adjustments that have to be made. And what about living conditions? Uh, where would you prefer to live in the new world? Maybe you love the country. And if you're assigned to live in the country, you'll be very happy. But suppose you love the country, but you're assigned to live in a city. Well, you can learn to love the city. Jehovah can help you to become whatever you need to become. Maybe you won't like being assigned to a city. Maybe you expected to have your log cabin. Tough. Deal with it. <laughs> it seems the Jehovah's Witness vision of the paradise is slowly getting closer and closer to what we kind of already have. We already have cities. We already have governments that are slowly but surely coming round to the idea that humans need to live more sustainably. And they're putting into place policies to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So governments are kind of already on this. And Jehovah's Witnesses are coming up with this version of paradise that's essentially what the target of governments is, for there to be both cities and people living in rural communities in a way that's not harming the planet. So again, just baffling that David Splane, out of nowhere, hits us with that. I look forward to seeing the artwork <laughs> of these Jetsons-style futuristic paradise cities Again, who's going to be building them? Who's going to be the Jehovah's Witness who, instead of frolicking with pandas, has to operate the crane for building these skyscrapers or has to work in the metal foundry for making the, the metal beams that are going to hold up these large structures? If I were a Jehovah's Witness, I wouldn't like to get that gig. But apparently some Jehovah's Witnesses 
are going to have a rougher time in paradise than others. Point number 10, the rulership of the paradise is going to consist of people like Anthony Morris, Stephen Lett, David Splain, Mark Sanderson, the governing body members who can't even get it right when it comes to how to deal with child sex abuse, who think that it's acceptable to keep details of thousands of predators on a secret database that doesn't get handed over to law enforcement. These are the idiots who think that they have the wisdom to rule over an entire planet. That's going to be the rulership from heaven with Jesus, someone like Tony Morris or someone like Stephen Lett. Just to think if you're a Jehovah's Witness, and maybe you don't know much about the whole child abuse issue, fair enough. But even putting all of that aside, even if you think that the way the governing body is handling abuse and the way the governing body is dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses is perfectly fine, they're not contributing to people committing suicide, they're not manipulating or exploiting people, everything about the governing body is great. Just look at them, for goodness sake, and compare them with truly wise people of their age group, people like David Attenborough, for example. Watch David Attenborough speaking about our planet and about his vision for humanity and compare it with someone like Tony Morris talking about apostates being riddled with maggots. There's just no comparison if, if you were going to craft a global leadership, you would not be headhunting the likes of Tony Morris, Stephen Lett, David Splain, Jeffrey Jackson. You just wouldn't. They're manifestly ill-equipped as human beings for the immense authority of ruling over an entire planet. Point number 11, and I realise I'm reaching a little bit here, but it is nevertheless something that you have to contend with if you are a Jehovah's Witness who believes in a literal paradise earth that will exist forever. You have to contend at some point with the fact that everything is finite in our universe. Our solar system is finite. It has a lifespan our sun has been around for approximately 4.6 billion years and it's about halfway through its lifespan. So it has another four and a half to five and a half billion years, scientists estimate, before it burns up and takes with it the whole solar system so that there can be no life of any kind really in our solar system once the sun has gone. How does that work with living forever on a paradise earth? Again, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, as with many of these points, you just have to essentially invoke magic and say, oh, God's going to magically fix everything. He's going to wave a magic wand at the sun and make the sun different from all the other stars in that are observable to humans, which all burn out at some point. The sun will be the exception. The sun will burn forever. If God just gets to move the goalposts like that, if every conceivable scientific hurdle just gets shrugged off with these magical claims, the more of these claims you make, the more you do this shrugging off, the more you have to ask, is this not just a bit man-made. Is it not obvious that this whole concept of a paradise earth is unfeasible and ultimately the brainchild of a religious leadership who haven't thought all of these things through so that it only makes sense when you make excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. Which finally brings us to point 12 on my list which is the small point <laughs> that the entire paradise teaching is not 
scriptural. Jehovah's Witnesses jump up and down about this being a promise of God's that is in the Bible. There's just one small problem. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about what Jesus said about people who are resurrected being like the angels. Neither will they marry nor will they be given in marriage. It seems obvious that Jesus was expecting people to be resurrected into heaven. He was describing followers of his dying and going to heaven or an afterlife in heaven. He didn't have in mind this Jehovah's Witness concept of a terraformed planet where a hundred billion people who have ever lived or died get resurrected after Armageddon. That is absent from Jesus' teachings. Jehovah's Witnesses effectively insert it in the Bible narrative. And there are a few clearer demonstrations of this than to simply say, how many times does the word paradise appear in the Bible? If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you would expect there to be considerable, repeated mention of the concept of a paradise earth in the Bible if that's God's master plan. There's just one small problem. The word paradise only appears four times in the entire Bible. And one of those times, or should I say only one of those times, is applied by the organization as referring to an earthly paradise. The other three are supposedly referring to heaven or their figurative. So here on the screen, you will see all four references to paradise in the Bible. And it's only the one in Luke 23, verse 43. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the only reference to paradise in the Bible that Jehovah's Witnesses claim refers to a literal earthly paradise. If you're God, and that's really your master plan, you haven't communicated it very well, have you? If out of all of the books of the Bible and all of the many chapters and verses, you've only bothered to mention the word paradise four times. Again, the only way you can make any real argument is by hijacking these restorationist verses that were intended to poetically make promises about God's people being blessed post-exile, about God making his people prosperous and making grandiose claims about how the earth would be beautified and how God's people would live in harmony with nature. It's only by hijacking those verses and saying, ah, well, these are referring to an earthly paradise. Only then can you start to make the argument stick. But what you're doing is you're taking Bible verses out of context just to suit your narrative. The Bible doesn't support an earthly paradise, which kind of makes sense given how outlandish and implausible the entire concept is when you think about it in any detail. But that's all I have to say on the subject of the Jehovah's Witness teaching of a paradise earth. I must just thank my patrons who asked me to make this video in particular. I think it's an excellent topic. Good choice, patrons. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.